This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or the Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay, on with the show. I spent a good portion of my teens going to raves. Baggy pants, light shows, house music, happy hardcore, drum and bass. You know, raves. I bought glow sticks, covered my arms in jelly bracelets, and went to foam parties. You know, foam parties. Oh, you don't know foam parties? You should consider yourself lucky. I do not recommend them. One of the worst times I ever had at a party was at a foam party. Uh, when we showed up, there were all of these people, and they were wearing gas masks. We thought, oh, that's weird. Maybe it's like a new fashion trend in the club scene here. It wasn't. When they finally let loose with the foam, which is made with soap, I don't know what I was expecting it to be made with, just not soap. It became so hard to breathe that even though one of our favorite DJs at the time, Bad Boy Bill, was on stage with four turntables, we left. We had to. The air was thick, and it burned to inhale, and if you did so deeply, you would set off on this terrible coughing fit. So that's why everyone brought gas masks. Got it. We didn't. And so we couldn't breathe, and if you can't breathe, you can't dance, and if you can't dance, what's the point? Mostly I look back pretty fondly on my days of questionable fashion choices and even more questionable party venues. There was this one time, and this is the last anecdote, I promise, because if I don't cut myself off, this episode will be hours long. This one time at this one party in Springfield, Massachusetts, the venue, which is a term I use loosely, shut off the water going to the sinks so that all of the ecstasy-taking partygoers had to pay $4 for a 16-ounce bottle of Poland spring water. Ever the resourceful bunch, though, some friends chose instead to fill their crushable water bottles, a necessary accoutrement because outside containers were not permitted. Let me tell you, sneaking things into parties is a whole topic in and of itself. Anyways, they choose to fill their crushable water bottles from the back tanks of the toilets, which the venue was both smart and stupid enough to keep on. Anyways, what was I talking about? Oh, right. Looking back fondly, which I do, I promise, for reasons actually very much related to the gas masks and the toilet tanks. The experience of going to these parties was very much about getting in sync with this group of people. Like so many incredibly specialized niche and tight-knit communities, there were all of these, I don't know, for lack of a better word, customs, norms... And over time, you become inculcated with the survival skills needed to bear and enjoy a setting with many and varied challenges. In my experience of the dance and, for that matter, punk rock communities, it's easy to step through the front door of a party or show, but then there's this process of familiarizing yourself with the world on the other side of that threshold. Because, I mean, it can occasionally be a little counterintuitive. Kids are taking drugs that make them really dehydrated. They're also dancing like crazy. 
You don't want some kid to die at your party. Water should be free and easy to obtain. Nope. Water's four bucks. And, like, lots of people think punk rockers. They think of them as being aggressive, hateful folk. They see slam dancing or moshing or whatever you want to call it as a logical next step performance of aggression towards members of their own community. In reality, like yes, punk rock is to some degree about frustration and catharsis, but in local communities especially, everyone understands what everyone else is trying to get out of their experience. It's rare, in my experience, that punk rockers tolerate the purposeful injuring of others in the name of that catharsis. Basement punk shows are amongst the most enjoyable, communal, and careful locations I've ever been. There are rules you learn from being in the pit. Keep your teeth together, keep your elbows below your chin, and if you're going to kick, kick low. And if you're between the pit and the crowd, make sure people who don't want to be in the pit don't get pushed into it. And if someone forgets, gets excited, or just shit happens, and someone gets socked or knocked to the ground, everything stops. I mean, sure, to a certain degree, a punk rock show is something like a Dothraki wedding. Fewer than three broken noses might be considered a dull affair, but unlike a Dothraki wedding, no one is expecting or wishing harm on anyone. And no one is hoping to break someone else's nose. At least, I hope not. That being said, actually, I would never step into the pit at a metal show in an arena or something. Bald dudes with suspenders, no shirt on, and big work boots? Nope, those guys just look like they want to hurt someone. I will stick with a crowd of hyperactive, leather jacket-clad rapscallions who will pick you up after they accidentally clock you one. Anyway, this is all to say that I think of the dancing aspect of these communities as a metonym for the larger theme of syncing up, becoming accustomed as a whole. When people come together as communities, especially communities which are open to some degree to the public, there is a long, sometimes infinite process of reaching cultural synchronization based on some external set of values and practices. When people dance as a group, there is the act of bodily synchronization to some external set of rhythms. What I might say dance music has, over and above punk rock, and really any other music community I've been personally involved in, though I would be happy to be challenged on this point, is specific and actually rather principled emphasis on that synchronization, culturally, musically, and bodily. Anyone who was a member of the party scene in the 90s is probably familiar with the then-ubiquitous acronym PLUR. P-L-U-R, for peace, love, unity, and respect. A kind of loose code of honor between partygoers. We're all just here to dance, man, and become one with the crowd. Have this uplifting communal experience with other humans. Togetherness was always a big message of the parties that I went to. Once, a couple of friends jokingly even started a mosh pit between themselves, a significant distance from any other partygoer, and a towering, goggles-and-beads-wearing gentleman crossed the floor, no less than a 30-yard walk, to put his hand calmly on one of their shoulders. He instructed, simply, Not here. Okay. Last anecdote, for real. That one was the last one, I promise. From what I can gather, this is still the case in dance music communities, unless you're at a Skrillex show, I think. This is the charge that I've heard levied against so-called bro step, that it has sacrificed much of the communal aspect for a kind of faux metal posturing, encouraged or perhaps reinforced by the timbre and speed of the music. I'm not sure which is the chicken and which is the egg here, sound or audience attitude. Back in my day, even a small, private acts of hostility were not tolerated. The emphasis was on respect and unity. And interestingly, there's one feature of dance music, which I'll occasionally refer to as EDM for electronic dance music, which distills and exemplifies this fact, which refines togetherness and shared experience and expectation. I'm talking about... The drop. 
the beat drop, the bass drop, the dropping of the beat, whatever you want to call it, the drop. And that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of this episode of Reasonably Sound. The drop is the thing that happens in EDM where, after certain important structural elements like drums or the bass line have been removed, they are reintroduced with the utmost dramatic effect. It's tough to get a real sense of the effect without listening to a whole track because part of the experience of the drop, which might happen any number of times during one track, though usually twice, each more climactic than the last, is being taught by the song itself when and how the drop will occur. And in order to talk about how that happens, first we should talk a little bit about how dance music works in general. It works by repeating things. A lot. In high school, I was... God, another anecdote. You're going to have to bear with me. In high school, I was playing one of my favorite Paul Van Dyke CDs during a writing class where my teacher unwisely let students pick the working soundtrack on various days. I think the idea was that exposure to different music would influence us to write in different tones. I don't know. It worked. I liked it. One day I brought in... Paul Van Dyke and my friend Liz, who may or may not actually listen to this podcast. If you do, hi Liz. Um, she asked after a while, is the CD skipping? It wasn't. In its most simplistic form, a dance track will come together like so. First, the track will start with a beat and maybe a bass line. This lets you know what the foundation of the track is. If it's not there from the start, after not long, harmonic backing will be introduced. Sustained synth pads, maybe a string section, big, nice washes of chords. This all lets you know what the mood of the track is. Next, the melody is introduced. At this point, you've maybe been appraised of a few more details about the beat or bass line. More than likely, the melody you're hearing is a verse melody, which will eventually transform into a chorus melody, or hook, which will be repeated lots because you can't get enough of it. And with all of the main elements now in place, it's a matter of changing, building upon, responding to, removing, and reintroducing them in sometimes subtle but sometimes drastic ways that gives the track a progression. A classic dance track comes together the way a narrative does. From the start to about a third or half of the way through, there's a steady build, at which point there's a mini denouement, after which is an even more extreme build heading to the climax where everything is revealed or undone or exposed. And for the remainder, we deal with the consequences of what just went down. And just like a narrative, it is challenging to create meaning from the progression if you don't know how the characters relate to one another. In both screenwriting and music composition, the process of explaining to the audience what the active elements of the story are and how they behave to one another is called exposition. You establish a state, and then within that state, elements exchange status. That exchanging creates progression. In this way, dance music, like narrative, is teleological, meaning it has a goal. It's heading towards something. In most cases, that thing it's heading towards is the drop. After you've learned what all of the parts of the track are and how they relate to one another, there is a building of tension up until the point where the foundational elements of the track are removed. This move, weirdly, both relieves tension and creates much, much more tension. The audience, as a result of the removal of a track's grounding force, feels untethered, unconnected, ungrounded, floating. We're going to talk more about these words in a few minutes. They're important. But as untethered as they are, the audience also knows from its collective experience of dance music what they're in for. At some point, everything will come rushing back. The foundation will suddenly and dramatically be reintroduced. The drop will occur. The question is when and how. And that's the excitement of hearing that progression as it happened. You could say that the job of a producer and the DJ is to do what Brian Singer and Christopher McQuarrie did with The Usual Suspects. 
or what Gillian Flynn and David Fincher did with Gone Girl, show how all of the parts we might generally understand relate to one another in a new and novel way. Except in dance music, it's boiled down not to a scene or a sequence, not even a line. In EDM, it occurs in a moment. I mean, you could argue that there is a moment where all of that sudden knowing, sudden relief of tension happens in the movies, but I think it's fair to claim that the drop is different. A different kind of moment. The closest I've come to watching a movie and having the same experience as listening to a DJ suggest, deny, suggest, deny, and then finally drop the beat was watching this thriller from a bunch of years back, What Lies Beneath, with Michelle Pfeiffer and Harrison Ford. And it's, I mean, it's clearly not the same thing, right? For one, it's a thriller. That tension comes from fear, not celebratory expectation, and so the reveal is not exciting or uplifting, but just... I don't know, something else. Also, it's definitely not a great movie. The dance music and narrative metaphor breaks down, is what I'm trying to say, if it were even standing to begin with. And I also want to make it clear that I'm not saying dance music tells a story as such, or that dance music producers or DJs are storytellers. I have the same problem with this that Stefan Sagmeister does. Like recently, I read an interview with somebody who designs roller coasters, and he referred to himself as a storyteller. No, fuckhead, you are not a storyteller, you're a roller coaster designer, and that's fantastic, and more power to you, but why would you want to be a storyteller if you design roller coasters, or if you are storytelling, then the story that you tell is bullshit. It's like this little itsy-bitsy little thing. Yes, you go through the space, and yes, you see other spaceships, and yes, that's your story. That's a fucking bullshit story. That's boring. It's just that commonly described shapes present in these creative endeavors are similar, and I find the comparison instructive. Actually, I think it's the fact that dance music doesn't generally contain narrative as such that makes the drop itself a potentially powerful thing. The drop is built atop a widely understood set of weirdly ingrained conventions that, unlike stories where an effective narrative reveal means things suddenly relate to one another in a new way that's maybe surprising, shocking, infuriating, what have you, the drop really is meant to fulfill your expectations exactly. A drop which is shocking or infuriating is not an effective drop, at least not on the drop's own general terms. It's maybe like a murder mystery where the first scene shows the murder and the entire story is in getting to the explanation of how and why it happened that way. The way you know it happens because you saw it, but the joy is in seeing how we get there. I don't know. I can't seem to shake this narrative metaphor. I think what I'm after here is that the drop describes some dialectic between surprising and fulfilling. At a well-thought-out and expertly deployed drop, listeners can find a very tough-to-describe sense of completion, actualization, satisfaction. Rangadil Solberg, whose name I'm sure I am butchering, so I want to apologize, um, in her paper Waiting for the Bass to Drop talks about the drop as being closely linked to a sense of falling. Her paper, by the way, is really great. I'll post a link to it in the show notes. Special thanks to Ethan Hine on Twitter for pointing me towards it. Anyway, she relates the drop to gravity and gravitation, because, you know, the drop, dropping, grounding. After feeling untethered, floating, unconnected, all of those words I mentioned before that I said we were going to talk about real soon. Well, right now is soon. Solberg bases her connections on the work of George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, specifically their book Metaphors We Live By, which, if you haven't read it, highly recommended. In it, they talk about how our ideas of how the world can and does operate are shaped by the metaphors we use to describe that operation. 
One of the most mind-blowing examples they describe is Michael Reddy's conduit metaphor, which shows up everywhere, but is perhaps most present in conversations about communication and the general transfer of information between people. See, I just did it right there. Transfer of information as if knowledge is a commodity or resource that is piped from one location to another through conscious action. Solberg talks about how the drop is a metaphor for a fall, which is made possible because the music sonically lifts the listener beforehand. The music picks you up, drops you back down. My suggestion, she writes, is that we have an auditive expectancy based on gravity of what will happen when something ascends, descends, and becomes intensified. And later, quote, Gravity is a possible approach to explore the clubber's feeling and expectation of first being built up, then held in complete suspense before subsequently being dropped and experiencing relief and grounding. Solberg even goes into some detail on production techniques which make effective drops. Amongst them are things that she terms uplifters and the drum roll effect. Uplifters are melodic or tonal features that increase in pitch and density and or volume just before the drop. And the drum roll effect is where drum sounds are repeated at smaller and smaller rhythmic intervals until the whole thing explodes and everybody in the club goes nuts. Both of these techniques create increased tension, which, when the drop comes, is converted into butt shaking and or fist pumping. To support her claims, Solberg even went to SoundCloud to grab some user comments left at the drop in particular tracks to see what language was used. Awesome and uplifting. I feel like I'm flying. And so on. And just as a quick digression. While I was reading up for this episode, I came across some research done by some folks at the Delft University of Technology, the purpose of which was to determine if there is a way to reliably detect where, in an EDM track, the drop occurs. One of the information sources they use to determine that location, if it is available for the particular track being studied, is SoundCloud comments. This makes me wonder so many things about SoundCloud comments. I got up. I decided to stop reading them a while ago, and I'm going to check back in now after having read these things. So anyways, Solberg's paper, I think, is a great rendering of what the drop does and how it makes some people feel. And really a great way of thinking about how we talk about the drop and dance music in general. What it is missing for me, though, is a discussion of the communal aspects of the drop. The way that it's an experience shared simultaneously by a group of people and how that is also reflected in what the drop does, how it makes people feel, and also a little bit of how that's all related to its history. So, en route to this episode's coda, I want to talk about those things. And I also want to talk about where the drop, as a phrase, comes from. I also want to listen to a bit more dance music. So, the drop hasn't always been the name of a particular moment in a particularly exciting piece of music. It has long been a piece of DJ terminology, though. The drop is short for needle drop, which is generally the act of dropping a needle on the surface of a record. In its most daily, mundane execution, this action is not a thing to dance wildly about, but enacted by a superstar DJ, here we go, it becomes a thing of glory. What someone who spends all day every day looking at and queuing up and listening to and dropping needles on records is able to do is read them. They can read their records. They look at their records, and in there, amongst what you and I would see as inscrutable grooves, this DJ sees sound. 
they see where the loud part of the track is, where the quiet part is, where the verse transitions to the chorus, and where the beat starts. So here's this DJ, up on stage, or at the block party, spinning records, mixing their heart out, cueing, cutting, etc. There's lots going on, and there are a lot of people dancing. They want this DJ to turn all of their favorite songs into a brand new, never before heard, never heard again party jam in surprising ways. The stakes are high. The DJ's hands busy. This record's reading DJ, then, is able to pull a record from their crate to serve some suddenly struck upon purpose, to fuel some spark of inspiration, place it on the platter, read it, and boom, drop that needle. No cueing, no headphones, just drop. And there it is, the perfect addition to this mix, or the perfect transition between two tracks. However it plays out, the perfect something new and surprising while also totally expected and fulfilling. The crowd didn't know they wanted it until it was given to them. Masterful. This technique has been around for roughly as long as DJing has, since the early 70s and the early days of hip-hop. People like Grand Wizard Theodore, credited with inventing both the needle drop and scratching, and Grandmaster Flash, credited with popularizing scratching, were using records they loved, electronics that were around, and power they siphoned from street lamps to form a community around this new type of music in New York City. The drop has a long history in hip-hop, and one predating its dance music sense. This is, I'm sure, not news to lots of hip-hop fans generally, or Beastie Boy fans specifically. Let me clear my throat! Kick it over here, baby pop! And let all the fly skimmers feel the beat! Mm, drop! But I want to bring it up to make the point that the drop its related turntable technique, and even compositional function is neither the product of nor solely found in dance music. There's endless, regrettable African-American erasure in American music history, from Sister Rosetta Tharp to Pharrell's recent testimony in the Blurred Lines case explaining, as Pitchfork puts it, quote, that white artists getting credited for black work is industry standard. And while I am far far from the best person to address this on the whole, this particular subject happens to be a thing I know something about, and I don't know. I mean, I just, I hear people talking about how the drop is a new thing, about the communal experience of it and its particular sonic function being something club dudes with haircuts have brought to the music-loving public, and it's not. It just isn't. But I also bring it up to make the point that The Drop has been releasing people who have been uplifted by their experience of music, sure, but it's also always, and perhaps for even longer, been pushing them closer together. Ultimately, the sensory experience of The Drop is personal. It is wholly phenomenological. And while some people might feel like they have been dropped, some feel like they have been released ejected, caught, exploded. I've seen people say it feels like dropping down a gear and flooring it, or quote, like the feeling you get from removing that plastic that's on your phone when you buy it. Over and above this, I might argue that the drop has always represented some ultimate moment of sync amongst a group of listeners, amongst a community of people. Hip-hop, dubstep, or house, a good drop is a moment of communication between DJ and audience, audience and DJ, audience and itself. I think that this is really crucial to the discussion, and is significantly communal in the way that phenomenological experience is not. I might even argue, against my own better judgment that's creeping up on me as I say this, so I'm going to say it quick to see if I can outpace it, that the drop even does this when one is listening on their own, on their headphones, by themselves. Even as a purely sonic event, the drop, to me, still suggests communal experience. That even in solo listening, the crowd, big or small, and their actions and reactions are still conjured. It's not that 
no one is ever alone when listening to music which drops a beat. It's more like much of this music's energy is derived from the situation it's ideally composed for. Use determines attitude, I don't know, is maybe what I'm trying to say here. The drop, to me, represents the moment where the crowd, conjured or actual, is meant to reach maximum wavelength sameness. It's a dramatic expression of what many audience members hope and expect from clubs and parties. That musically fueled togetherness. Unity. With maybe some peace. And love. Definitely not $4 water and foam, though. That's for sure. My name is Mike Rugnetta. And this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at ReasonablySND. And you can find me on Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram at Mike Rugnetta. 